This video is going to be on the origins of the Morse, the Steve Morse One Step website and the census tools that are there that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of researchers have used. And I'm going to tell you about the three of us that set it up and I will name these people later. This is another of my JDW talks. If you haven't used the One Step website for census research, eventually you will use the One Step website. And that's my audience. Find out more about uh, the early history of it. And this was recorded in November of 2020. Here is what I attempt to accomplish here. Uh, we'll talk about a little, briefly the One Step site at stevemorse.org. All the people, the groups of people who have used our census tools, talk about an essay that I put together that uh, documents uh, that, that historical process. Talk about the three people who were in, mainly involved in setting it up, and I am Joel Weintraub. We'll look at an overview of how we all got together and how that uh, particular initial utility uh, was created. We'll look at one step census menus over time and a little bit about the traffic going through the one step website. Uh, we'll look at our main census capabilities, all the things that we now have online freely available. And then I will end it uh, by showing you a list of uh, volunteer names who helped with the transcriptions. So that's my, um, that's my goal. The One Step website, stevemorse.org, has a, a master menu, and I have duplicated it here. There are lots and lots of different utilities there. Didn't start that way. But I'm going to concentrate mainly on the census utilities that I, Dave, and Steve started initially. And that is the U.S. Census and the New York Census, the New York City Censuses. And I went through and figured out all the people, all the types of people who have used our census tools. And certainly the number one group would probably be genealogists. But we get periodically graduate students working on PhD theses who discover our website and will save them quite a bit of time. Uh, and we give them permission to use the actual databases. But you can see reference librarians, genealogy librarians, um, Census Bureau people actually have asked us questions. The National Archives used our databases for the uh, integ integral part of the 1940 census they had online. People who want to find out who lives in their house, let's say, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, sociologists and um, the University of Minnesota uh, IPUMS Center uh, has also used our, our material. So lots and lots of people have used it. I went through my files and found emails from myself, uh, Dave, and Steve. And in addition to that, Dave had written a essay in 2005 uh, at my uh, request to summarize the history of our early endeavor. And so let me show you the, uh, uh, the group of us. Here we have Steve on the left. I am on the right. And here we have a person whose name is Dave Case. That's the way that last name will be, um, will be pronounced. And the, I'm giving you a link here on that essay I put, put together from the three of us. Um, and uh, it's 20 pages. Lots of the original emails are there, uh, lightly edited. So take a look. Take a look at what it took uh, to come up with a prize-winning um, 
part of that of that one step website. Unfortunately, Dave died in a rafting accident in Utah in 2019. So I'm dedicating this video to his memory. And we'll tell I will tell you uh, about each of us and I'll tell you about about Dave. So here is uh, the first person. That's me. I was born in Manhattan, New York City in May of 1942. And in fact, this upcoming 1950 census will be the first one that I'm actually on. I graduated from City College in New York, CCNY. Great school. And went out to California, got a PhD in zoology from UC Riverside and was hired by the biology department at Cal State Fullerton, CSUF, and achieved emeritus professor of biology status in 2001 when I took early retirement. My interests are in vertebrate ecology, predator food habits, and I've been involved in training teaches docents in nature interpretation as well. I have publications in the fields of animal ecology, animal behavior, ornithology, which is the study of birds, and biological education. And once I started getting involved in genealogy when I retired, I have publications in the field of the U.S. and New York City censuses and Ellis Island immigration. I also have, as you should be aware, a YouTube channel called JDW Talks that has my genealogy and biology talks there. I volunteered nine years at the National Archives and Records Administration uh, nearby at Laguna Niguel, California, and they moved out to the Riverside, California area. And so here's some additional notes that I'm proud about that I was uh, president of a People Over Pollution nonprofit in Fullerton. I was director at Cal State of the GE Honors Program, and I helped create and was the director of the Environmental Studies Master's Program. Uh, one of the award that I cherish the most was the Orange County Science Education Association 1996 Outstanding Science Educator Award. And I continue to train people. Uh, I am a presenter at the Upper Newport Bay Conservancy Naturalist Trainee Program. And I've done that for 25 years. So I had a picture of myself at the National Archives. They were celebrating in 2009 uh, their uh, formation. And at the National Archives, I got uh, to work with their film. I realized that in order to do what I wanted to do, I had to be able to digitize the film. And I, we have no budget for this project. It's all out of pocket. We had no grant money. We accepted no outside funds. And I figured a way of using a simple point-and-shoot camera with some extra lenses. I've always been interested in cameras and had a black and white dark room. And I was able to digitize a roll of film in two to three hours. And once we had it, we could put it online and have volunteers from all over the world. And I estimate that um, I have I made close to 200,000 uh, film frames since 2001 uh, to support the census projects. Hi, I am Joel Weintraub, and it is November 2020. And I have a little script I put together to tell you a little bit more about um, the situation in 2002. When I created the first databases in 2001 to search the census by location, I had real questions, real questions on whether the material would be easy to use, that the tools would do what I thought they could, whether the public would actually use them, and whether I was, in fact, wasting my time. And that's the reason I called my initial project, tongue-in-cheek, 
the ITWIT project, I-T-W-I-T, standing for Is It Worth It? But then Dave Case came on the scene. He's on my website on Yahoo Groups, which no longer exists. And um, I'll talk about Dave next. And then he got Steve Morse on the project uh, who built the website or built the utility. And I soon dropped those initials to describe the transcriptions because they really, really made a difference. Really great. And I sit here now looking back at our accomplishments and looking ahead to the opening of another U.S. census to the public. And that's going to be the 1950 census on April 1st, 2022. And it took us seven and a half years, uh, but we're in good shape. We have everything online already, the locational tools. I decided to bring together all the material I had in my files on PowerPoint presentation I had given um, and uh, uh, Dave's essay that he, that he wrote in 2005 and show how the three of us, Dave, myself, and Steve, created the initial one-line uh, online page within the Morse One Step website. It took us 10 days, 10 days to do that in 2002. This video also gives me an opportunity to show you the growth of the census section of the One Step site and to thank the many volunteers, and I counted, almost, and you will see them later, almost 250, 250 of them who have helped us achieve our goals. We are the main, really the only online source for finding people by location on the federal and the New York State censuses and the New York State census was for New York City. And to boot, it's freely, freely given to the public. So let me turn now to Dave, David R. Case. That's how you pronounce the last name. Dave was born in Baltimore, Maryland in November 1950. Uh, he went to the University of Maryland College Park, got a BS there, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and then went into computer science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he got his PhD degree. After graduation, Dave taught, in fact, all three of us uh, taught at the university level. He taught computer science at North Carolina State University, and eventually he moved to Waltham, Massachusetts in 1980. And I'm getting much of this from his online obituary. He worked as a computer software engineer, and that's where he uh, met uh, Steve Morse, who we'll talk about next, uh, in the Boston area. And he was on a team that wrote a software language called Ada. He joined in Waltham, the Land Trust, in 2001. That's about when, uh, just a year before, uh, we started to really correspond. He served as the organization's clerk. Uh, I have pictures of him uh, performing in musical theater. He volunteered for Meals on Wheels, and he also was a volunteer at the National Archives branch at Waltham, where he found out about the 1930 census that was going to uh, occur uh, the next spring and the problems associated with it. And he searched the website and finally found my small pocket website on this, on this subject. The third person, uh, the, mo the most uh, well-known of the three of us, is Stephen P. Moore. Steve was born in Brooklyn in May of 1940. And in fact, he's, this, the 1950 census uh, that's coming up will be the first one that he will see himself on when it becomes public in 2022. He has degrees in electrical engineering, also from CCNY, City College of New York. And he went on and got a PhD degree from NYU. He has an impressive 
career. He worked for a number of research facilities and development centers, and he's best known as the chief architect of the Intel 8086 processor, the predecessor of today's Pentium processor. He wrote the book on it. And so, uh, you know, really an important um, position in the field of computers. He taught at City College of New York, uh, Pratt Institute, UC Berkeley, uh, State University of New York, Stanford, and San Francisco State. He's authored numerous technical papers, written for textbooks, and holds four patents. And uh, he decided he was always interested in genealogy, uh, but he's a applied his expertise, and his expertise is also in uh, producing websites that are really uh, simple to use, intuitive, um, and his one-step, so-called one-step search pages are widely used by genealogists and other researchers, especially for searching Ellis Island passenger lists and U.S. and New York City censuses. He has a number of awards. The website has a number of awards. Um, Lifetime Achievement Award from the IAJGS, uh, the uh, International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies. Uh, the National Genealogical Society is given an award of merit, merit, and you see some others as well. Family Tree Magazine has uh, published 100 best genealogy websites. There are thousands, tens or hundreds of thousands genealogy websites, and the One Step website has been in that top 100 for 15 years, from 2005 to 2020. So let me give you, in a couple of slides, an overview of our history. So here I am at Cal State Fullerton in May of 2001. After taking early retirement, I went over to the local National Archive and became a docent, helping people. And they told me, uh, there are lots of buzz about it, that the 1930 census was going to be available in April of 2002. And it would be very difficult, very difficult to find people uh, until a name index was made. And I said, you know, I think I have an idea about making databases of street names. People said to me, Joel, you're crazy. Uh, you know, you can't do that. Well, they were right about one of those two things. And so in January of 2002, by myself, I had transcribed 56 large cities, their street names in each of the census districts, and put them online on a small website with a crude search engine. And that's when Dave saw, did a, did a Google search, saw what I had done, contacted me and suggested ways of streamlining the data. If we look at the history of the One Step site, here is Steve Morse, the chief architect of the 8086 computer chip, and he wrote the book on it. And in January of 2001, he had a website. It had three things on it, three things on it. And then what changed was in April of 2001, the Ellis Island Passenger Database became public. It was a big event, but it was really difficult to access because it would ask you a question, you would fill it in, then it would ask you another question, you would fill it in, and then it would say, I'm sorry, uh, we have so much traffic, we're going to have to kick you out. And it was just ridiculous. And so Steve figured out a quick way, a one-step way of asking, of answering, all, of asking and answering all of the information needed all at once. And so here we now have, in 2001, 2002, uh, an expanding website. 
which now includes a number of utilities to search the Ellis Island database. So how did we get together? We have Steve Morse, we have Joel Weintraub, and the person that was instrumental in this and also worked uh, to uh, um, when, when Steve was creating the utility gave a lot of input as well. But Dave, in January of 2002, knew Steve, wrote to Steve and said, hey, there is this problem here. Joel could use some help. And Steve wrote to me and together we made a commitment. So let me bring in Steve and myself and tell you what we agreed on. I spent a lot of time on this slide, so I decided to include it from a previous PowerPoint. Provide space and coding for projects. Maintain and expand the census databases. And so the 1930 census utility appeared on the One Step website. I didn't realize at the time it was going to be one of many uh, of census utilities that eventually ended up on this website. So I thought it'd be useful to take a look at that website over time. Here we start with 2001-2002, uh, uh, in which now we have a large number of Ellis Island utilities. Then in the fall of 2002, as you look at this, we now have the 1930 census added to the list. So that's the first of the uh, census utilities. By 2004, there were enough utilities in the census section to have their own section on the One Step website. You can see now we have some information about 1920 as well here. That's 2004. In 2008, uh, we now have quite a number of additional uh, census tools, uh, including looking ahead to the 1940 census, which became public in 2012. It's 2008. And here is the growth of the One Step website. Uh, the table on the bottom doesn't quite match the columns on the top. You see there are six columns. Uh, six sections on the top and there are six sections on the bottom. So when the One Step website was just getting started, it was getting about 4,000 hits a day. And by the time we get to 2008, it was getting 73,000 hits a day. In 2012, we now have a lot of stuff on the 1940 census. Um, Lots of uh, situations here. And there are so many different um, utilities that Steve put together something called the Unified Tool, which combines a lot of these in one tool. And that's the tool that you should start with when you're doing census research. And what happened in 2012 when the 1940 census became public? Well, in 2011, the site was getting about 80,000 hits a day. In 2012, when the census became public on April 2nd, because the first was a uh, Sunday, we went up to two and a quarter million hits. Two and a quarter million hits. And there were three other websites that we allowed them to use our databases, including the National Archives site. So millions of people probably uh, used our website for the 1940 census. And here we are in 2020. And you can see now we have the 1950 census already uh, online, 
freely available. You can expect on the One Step Census Aids now that we have transcribed the enumeration di district definitions for all those censuses there. And we also have the, eight, though not shown there, we also have the 1870 U.S. Census for New York City, the second enumeration. We have here um, transcriptions of cities, large cities, and all the street names in each of their census districts. And you notice that in 1950, we pretty much have most urban areas above 5,000 and certainly above 25,000 uh, population. So that if you have an address in a large city, we'll probably be, and you can't find it on a name index, and of course there won't be a name index in 19, for the 1951 when it first becomes public, we are there to help you. We thank Dr. John Logan for, for, for providing us information for 1880. We also put together uh, from a number of people who helped us uh, the 1890 to 1925 uh, censuses that pertain to the city of New York. And it's there. 1890 is the police census. And the 1892, 1905, 15, and 25 are the New York State Census, if they are available. And so I want to thank our volunteers. Uh, some of them are no longer alive for their help with our projects. And the first one are the federal uh, projects we did, the federal census. If you have uh, helped us, you, you know, I'm hoping I didn't make a mistake here, have your name on this list. You probably, a lot of people, were involved in more than one of these federal projects. And I counted 230 of you. Some people may have done one city's transcription. Some people may have done quite a bit more. This is alphabetical, obviously, by first name. And then for the New York City Census Project, I have a number of people who help with that as well. So I hope you enjoyed that little historical timeline walk about the origins of the Morse One Step website census tools. This was one of my JDW talks on YouTube. I have a number of census talks, Ellis Island talks, and biology talks. And for the upcoming 1950 census, keep in mind that I already have online at, on YouTube an overview of the 1950 U.S. Census for genealogists. That is the title uh, slide and also a detailed look at how to use our census location search tools. So enjoy yourself when that comes out. And for those of you who are around on April 1st, 1950, you should be on that census in t opening in 2022 to the public.